<laughs> and tens of thousands of pounds of hard work and practice. Um, as you probably know, it's the Recuerdos de la Alhambra by Francisco Torrega. And um, <coughs> many years ago, I started playing guitar, like most of us here, probably as a teenager, 16 years old, steel string guitar. And then I sort of started playing classical guitar. And I heard that tune, and that determined that I wanted to one day be able to play it. Uh, so that set me out on a, on a long course. Anyway, um, let me take you back in history now. Uh, the guitar, as we know it today, the ones we see around us, are relatively modern creatures. They probably reached their sort of peak, or reached their almost can't say to the development of the classical ones, in the middle of the 19th century in Spain, with um, makers like the great Torres. Um, The, the guitars then that were being made by the likes of Pernas in Grenada and, and Torres in, in Seville were, were, were all right, they were fairly good guitars, but music was changing. Guitars were becoming more and more involved in solo playing rather than accompaniment for dancers and, and singers and things. So there was a need to develop the guitar to make it louder and, and, and to certain music. There was, there was great composers at the time, Sol or Chulo and the others were making compositions that needed a different type of instrument. Um, one of the many ways that they tried to develop the instrument then, to make it louder, make it smoother, less harsh, was to add something called a tournaboz to the guitar, which is a brass or bonds, some of them use bonds, funnel that fits inside the guitar. And um, it, was, it was an inverted cone. It actually translates as turned voice, because they tried to turn the voice of the guitar round onto the back and then bring it forward to amplify the sound of the guitar. Also, they wanted to try and reduce the harshness of some of the treble size to suit the more Mediterranean style of music, the softer uh, style of music that was played then. Um, Torres is usually um, reckoned to have invented it, but Panas was building them at about the same time, so it's, it's six of one, half does the other. Torres is more famous, so he's the one that got the, uh, the credit, like Darwin and, you know, you, uh, yeah, the get, famous man gets the credit. But um, in around uh, 1869, not around, in 1869, a uh, young player was brought by Pujol to see Torres, a guy called Torrega. And Torrega uh, played all the guitars that Torres had in the shop. And Torres just said, they're not good enough for you. Torrega was such a good player that he said, they weren't good enough for you. And he went and got his own personal guitar he made and gave it to Torrega and said, you have this one. It was a guitar called FE17. <laughs> FE17. FE stands for First Epoch, by the way. That's his first period of Torres building. When he moved his shop to another one, it became SE, Second Epoch guitars. But First Epoch number 17 was the guitar uh, that was uh, owned by Torrega and used by Torrega to compose that tune and a lot of his other great tunes on. So that fired my interest up. I wanted to play that tune. I wanted to play it like Torrega. I needed a Tornavoz guitar, I thought I did. Anyway, if we now move forward uh, a little bit in time, let's say about 100 years, um, I was very lucky in that I had got a chance to go to Siguenza in Spain and study on the course, the Master Guitar Guild building course with Jose Juanmineos uh, and his son Liam. Liam's a brilliant guitar builder as you probably know, but he studied with, with Jose and, and his. And they were brilliant. We spent weeks building a guitar under the uh, supervision of Jose and Liam. And then in the evening, it was like this, right? We all sat around, drunk lots of wine, and played guitars. Uh, that, that was the best part of course. But the guitars we were playing uh, were guitars that Jose had borrowed 
from all the big collections in Spain. So, from uh, the uh, collection of, I think it, who had it, it was uh, Pratt Polares collection, I never remember it. I should remember the name Pratt, shouldn't I really? <laughs> but, um, <laughs> from his collection, they borrowed FE17 to Rager's guitar. So we got to actually sit around and play Tarragas guitar. Probably one of the most valuable instruments in the world. But, you know, it's like here, you just picked it up and uh, played it. And there's three of us there, two other great builders. To my mind, the finest young builder of um, classical guitars I've ever known. Dave knows him as well. Joshua French, who a young Texan mm -hmm. in his late 20s, Joshua. He was a brilliant, brilliant guitar player, really great builder and great fan of, Tor of Torres as well. He's now given up building guitars because he couldn't make a living at it. Best in the world, in my view, couldn't make a living. He's a professional poker player now. Um, that makes sense. And the other one was a chap called Gerhard Olgitus from Germany. And Gerhard and Joshua and I used to sit around playing this uh, Torres guitar. And we both all got really interested in it. And the thing about Torres' um, guitars, like Strad violins, all of Torres' guitars, or most of them, have been taken apart, rebuilt, repaired, put back together again. And so no one knows quite how Torres uh, built the Torres, or how he fitted them in the guitars, because they've all been altered. And of course, with the Torres in there, as you'll see, you can't see inside. So without taking the back off, you don't know how, what they're like inside. So anyway, the three of us decided that we were going to do a bit of research, find out how they were built, how they were made. And so... I think of explain it. Ah, wait. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we, we decided that we'd all do our own thing. Um, the three of us would split up, split the tasks amongst us according to our own skills. Joshua had to go away and work out how to make the tournaments and how it could be fitted into the instrument. Gerhardt was lucky in that at the time he had from a Japanese collection um, FE21D, which was another unaltered Tournois guitar, but it was in unplayable condition. So some, the guy sent it to him and said, "Can you, you know, get this playable?" But he, he looked, he hadn't got round to it by that time. I think he, he said he was trying to pluck the courage up to actually open a Torres guitar up for the first time. Uh, but he, he he went back to Germany and he took it to his local hospital. And guess what he did? He x-rayed it. He x-rayed it, yeah, so he could see what the original bracing was like inside. And uh, my task, because uh, I'm an academic scientist, my task was to um, go through the documentation and the, any records and history of all the guitars and do as an analysis of them, a statistical analysis. Well, <laughs> when I looked at round of it, you know, looked at it, looked at, looked at the paperwork, including the great Bible, the Bible that all guitar makers surely have got at least three or four copies of, 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 of the, the great Bible by Roman E. Olson. You haven't got it. <laughs> I've got three copies, literally, one in my one next to my bed, one in my uh, office, <laughs> and, one, and one next to my. You get when you get to my age, a book like this next to your bed is much more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope I do not get your age. <laughs> anyway, when I looked at it, I noticed when I did the research on all the guitars and the history of them all that all of the guitars that had either had or had had torn of Aussies removed, which many of them did, it became the fashion to take them out. All of them had had the lower harmonic bars replaced. That got me thinking, I'm not a great believer in coincidence, why out of all of his guitars was it that they needed the lower harmonic bar to be replaced? Ding. They didn't need to be replaced. They were put in because they were never there in the first place. They never had a lower harmonic bar in. So, <coughs> Joshua built the tournaments, sent us one each. I circulated the uh, details. So we couldn't find enough details of FE17, so we went to the next best thing, which was FE19, 
which was Tour de Bus Guitar, built the next year. And it's had, you know, been taken apart so many times, it doesn't bear any resemblance to its original condition. But in Jose's book, he shows the plantilla and the kite from it. You know the kite, the way you lay out the bracing from the origin point here, and the distances apart at certain points on the guitar, you can lay out how the bracing goes. So we knew how the bracing was built. So we all three of us set out to build our guitars. Now this, you can pass around later, this was the um, tour of Oz that Joshua made. It's brass, we turned the tops over, mounted it on another ring and it glues up underneath inside the soundboard. Okay. And then goes on in the usual way in the go bar. You just attach it on so you've got extra before the top harmonic bar goes on. And then you finish. Now, this picture that I'm about to show you, okay, it's gonna kill Dave us now. knows it, right? <laughs> now, before you all leave, you know um, in Men in Black, where he gets his little thing out of his pocket, Raise presses it, it, it raises the memory. Well, that's going to happen to all of you before you leave, okay? Uh, in the end, this was the bracing that we worked out and the, um, the picture how the top of a, an original Tour de Vos guitar looks. Okay? Can you, can you see that? I'll pass it around to come and look. If you compare that to the standard top, you can see the lower harmonic bar missing completely. What does that do? Well, basically you can open the harmonic bar all you like, but by the time it gets there, that bit of the soundboard is doing next to or nothing, doing bubble all. It's hardly moving at all. You can open the harmonic bars, you can do whatever you like. It's not doing very much. Here, it's working all the way up here. So you get more active soundboard, which we've been trying to go on steel strings. <coughs> you get a more active soundboard. And also the way this, the, the air moves inside the guitar is changed. So the, the, the air moves down and then comes up from the back further. It just resonates up and it projects better. So if you're, if you're a, a, a solo player, it'll project. I mean, long you have played it, I think you'll probably all agree that's what happens when you, when you listen to it. Anyway, we went round and built them all, and this was the first one. This was my original Tour de Vos guitar. Still got the Tour de Vos in. Never had the back taken off, so I can guarantee that it's exactly the same as it was when I built it. Um, and this became my actual recital and concert guitar, <coughs> one that I played in, in recital. Because uh, I became quite a, not a no, but I did got quite good at playing Torrega and Lobat. So, that became the guitar that I, I used to play Torrega on because it's the guitar, in effect, that Torrega composed it on. So the sound should be as close to the one that Torrega intended as possible. You know, it's like the original, original music groups playing uh, block music on block instruments now. Anyway, that's what I built and that's what I played. Um, I say the three of us started building. The one other guy that was on the course that was a good friend of ours, David LaPlante, who's a really good American builder. Um, he's, he's actually built a copy of Torres's cardboard guitar you know, with poster board back and sides to, to prove it a really good one. He's a good builder. We told him how they're made and, and he's built them as well. But uh, Joshua now has is, is retired from guitar making. Great shame, lost to the world. Incredible. Um, Gerhard, uh, because of his market in Germany, for they want the crisper sound of the uh, for Bach and the, and the German music, and uh, so I'm about the only. I think, as far as I know, I'm the only one making these now. Um, and um, there's only two, I think, in Britain. There's this one, and Professor Charles Ramirez at the Royal College of Music has the other one that I made for him because he's a bit of a Torrega buff. I think he won the Torrega Prize one. Year on it. Um, so I think that's a fairly, I, I don't you can say, I can't say fairly unique instrument in the country, but I think there's only two now. There's, I think I've made about 15 of them, and the two in Britain, there's one in Israel, and all of the others are in Spain. 
It's Coles to Newcastle time. <laughs> Spill the Spanish guitar, sell it in Spain. Let them pay it off. And I've got actually I've got a, 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 two shops, one in Blastlo and one in Seville, which uh, have said they'll take all the ones I can build because they, they, you know, they, they go out door because there's a big movement in Spain of people wanting to pay their original music, their Torrega, their low bet, their soul. And my, actually, Torrega is my favourite, but my another favourite mine is Ochillo, who is almost unknown, Ochillo. The only thing that's known about Ochillo is his surviving music and the fact that his name is mentioned in one line in a Spanish poem about soul, the composer soul. Soul and Ochillo are mentioned in one line in the poem and that's all anybody knows about it, but he's, he's a brilliant musician. Look his, up, his stuff up if you want to. Anyway, so that's the story. That's what I, 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 I built and what I, I played. Um, let's say you have a squint at any of the pictures you want to have a look at. And they say, I oh, can forget that top one. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> but now, I mean, you've all heard it being played. I mean, this is, if you'd like to be, you know, obviously, it, I have a, 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 a my beautiful assistant. <laughs> well, now, come up and, 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 and you, uh, I was hoping Johnny was going to be here today. So, so. Yeah, that's just just after him yeah, <laughs> But I mean, you know, the lad's willing. <laughs> <laughs> treble slash harsh, more bell-like, and you get a more ringing quality to the to the sound. When I played it, I actually played it with gut strings on it mainly. But these are Nile guts, which is about the closest you can get in the tone on quality. But it, it, that was the idea: is to is to make a sweeter sound than the the, the more harsh guitars and the particularly the very small body of guitars at the time. Don't forget, they were more harsh tone because what you're trying to do is Imagine, I mean, you're in Spain, you've got that warm Andalusian sun on your back, you know, you just want a smooth, luscious feel, you want to be enveloped in the music, not having it dying. So that's what we went for. And that, that was it. And then I was lucky enough to be asked um, by Charles, um, because he was my teacher as well, he taught me, he was my sort of classical trainer, and he asked me if I would record the Torrega um, canon for the Royal College of Music's archives as their reference recordings. So that's what I did. I did the Torrega and the Labette. Uh, and then, so I just finished before we make questions. This was my recordings. Guitar. And you should build that. Now, 2000, about 2000. This is something new. It's wonderful to play. Yeah, it's Interestingly, honestly, I did once go to a master class in the World College of Music with John Williams. He was, he was taking it to me and playing. And he was doing the Recuerdos, and I kept telling him he was playing it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was. You know, you've got to put the guy right when he's not, you know, not playing it wrong. <laughs> but the thing was, he was playing it on a small one. So it sounded. <laughs> <laughs>